This podcast is sponsored by Delupa. Delupa was founded by a former hedge fund analyst. He didn't have a tool that he trusted to be 99.9% accurate that allowed him to pull the updates directly into ex his existing models and that had the granularity and KPIs, guidance, and non-GAAP adjustments that he needed. So he built Delupa. Delupa is the fastest growing source for public company data with data available for over 3,000 companies. Hundreds of AI algorithms collect and organize customized company historicals with an accuracy level and depth of data that is higher than anything achievable by other modeling tools. Each data point in is audible to the source. Delupa's Excel plugin is the first to allow you to update your models in your existing format. It's simple and non-invasive. Delupa, Delupa's clients are able to cover more opportunities and generate more ideas. No more data errors, no more Excel monkeying, just the fundamentals. See why equity investors are switching to Delupa. Visit delupa.com slash Y-A-V-P. That's Delupa, D-A-L-O-O-P-A dot com slash Y-A-V-P to learn more. Hello and welcome to yet another value podcast. I'm your host, Andrew Walker. If you like this podcast, it'd mean a lot if you could follow, rate, subscribe, review it wherever you're watching or listening to me to it. Uh, with me today, I'm happy to have my friend and the founder of Range of Capital, Chris Demuth. Chris, how's it going? It's going great. Thanks for having me, Andrew. Thanks for coming on for the the monthly State of the Markets podcast. Let me start this way podcast the way I do every podcast. First, a disclaimer to remind everyone that nothing on this podcast is investing advice. That's always true, but that's particularly true today. We're going to talk about a bunch of different stocks and situations. We were talking before this uh, call, and I think we went through, you know, 100 million micro, micro cap company, $500 million meme stocks in distress, all sorts of things. So we're going to talk about a lot of stuff. Just remember, none of this is investing advice. Please do your own research. Consult a financial advisor. Uh, with all that out the way, it is G late January, January 26th, 2023. We've got a new year. Chris, what's on your mind for the new year? Well, I think uh, going a little farther afield within the event category than usual, because the two big um, kind of stuck between a rock and the hard place problems in the ARB world for me are still very much in place. Uh, one a uh, tricky financing environment for deals that are just blowing up kind of pre r potential takeovers all the time. I mean, I did not do this, but in hindsight, looking at this past year, just shorting all of the kind of takeover rumor stocks would have been an extremely uh, lucrative uh, place to find shorts. Yeah, uh, especially anything getting acquired by private equity, like a private equity fund would basically what we'd hear is they'd go in and they'd be doing, you know, their DCF model and they say, oh, we're going to raise a bunch of debt at 6%. And then three weeks into the deal, they'd be like, okay, the debt's 7%. And then, you know, three weeks later, they'd be like, the debt's 9%. And obviously, I'm just pulling numbers out. But when your debt cost goes from six to nine or, you know, 10 to 14 through two months of the process, all of a sudden, the prices you can change, like everything's just been destroyed. So yeah, it's been really and, tough on and that the side. few optimists amongst the private equity firm buyers right now, it's barely, lev it's, it's just a BO, it's barely a leverage buyout anymore. Uh, and uh, uh, the, it, the syndication kind of windows closed. Uh, something that, you know, might've been an example of me missing the, uh, uh, missing the forest, staring at a tree was thinking about Twitter the whole time, thinking about that as an investment in the contract, almost daily downgrading what the downside was and what it was worth as a standalone and what the incentive for the buyer was other than the contract. It was such an intoxicating topic that I don't think I pulled back enough to say, think about all the other ones that have no contract because that's what pre-arb and takeover rumors are. It's this without a requirement. And they pretty much all went bust or had modest uh, pre takeover premiums and so forth. All those dynamics are still there. So I'm still grouchy and bearish on takeover rumors. I don't mind if we miss a few early on this year. Like if we can get smarter about what environment we're in and miss... I mean, I'll probably be cranky the day we miss them, but like, you know, the kind of well um, projected deals, unless it just happens to be a company that we just really want to own anyways, and I haven't seen one of those, um, I'm going to be pretty shy on takeover uh, candidates. 
And then the other, uh, the, the, between a rock and a hard place, uh, a hard place is uh, zany regulators that are on uh, kind of uh, crusades against companies and deals, just trying to block everything and just brutally difficult regulatory processes. And then two things today, uh, just to highlight as examples, um, interesting to see press from Bloomberg stating that the US regulatory process on Activision, the timing was driven by trying to disrupt the companies and their ongoing talks with European regulators, which I find appalling. It's almost a regulatory body equivalent of tortious interference. You have a private company that happens to be an American taxpayer that is in a discourse with a regulator trying to fix a perceived problem. So these are real people with real problems in the non-fictional world trying to make things better. And this American regulator is saying, oh God, these guys are trying to solve a problem and fix something. We have to interfere with a process we're not involved in that would have universally applicable benefits, including to American customers, we have to stop that because something good might happen. And if it was good, it would make them look less bad. And so we would have less power over them. I mean, it's really uh, gross, uh, vulgar low behavior that if this was a private enterprise, it would be criminal and should be. You know, it reminds you, it, it, just, it, it just feels like a lot of regulators are living in their own world where companies are bad. And generally, I, I, I'm probably a little more uh, bullish on, I don't know, bullish, sorry, accepting of regulators than uh, you who lean a little more libertarian. But like, I think of the the Shaw, the Shaw hearing yesterday, where the, I mean, you listen to more of it than me, but where the Canadian regulator is almost thrown out of court because he goes in and he basically says, hey, these guys have a fix, but we don't like the fix. We didn't want them to fix this. We wanted to, we wanted to block this transaction. It's like, well, that's not really your job. Like your job as a regulator was fine. The original transaction would be harmful for consumers under your standard, block it, get them to amend it. Get the, but now that they have a remedy and it's fine, you know, like it's no longer your job to go and say like, oh no, you know, we just didn't like this deal to begin with. Now that they've got a remedy to fix the consumers, we're just, we're angry they have a remedy. Like that doesn't make sense. Or I think of uh, one ongoing that we've talked on this podcast before. I mean, I don't think we're there yet, but Spectrum Brands, where uh, we're not quite to the regulators saying, oh gosh, they're, they're going to get a deal through that we didn't like to begin with. So screw this. But if we're getting close where Spectrum Brands, they have a merger. Uh, they're selling their high end door division. They've got divestures for everything that the government has a problem. And they're going to the court because the government's trying to block them and saying, hey, we've got a divestiture and fix the problem. And the government's basically saying, no, 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 no. We don't care about divestiture. Just block this deal. Like, it, it's just, it's very, it, yeah, I don't, I don't even no, know. Those, those are both terrific examples. I listened to the whole hearing yesterday morning in uh, Canada. Um, uh, my wife thought I was not being respectful enough of the uh, regulator and hopes that I'm not in front of the same guy ahead in uh, some future deal. Yeah, where I might not be allowed to go to Toronto or but, Ontario or but, anything. But Chris. good Lord, this person was very clearly, I mean, he was shaking. He almost looked like he was crying because the thing he thought was a problem was going away and he wanted something to hang them with. He wanted a problem to maintain his kind of petty authority, he didn't want, he was, he, was, he was shaking to the point of almost crying that this problem would go away, which totally reveals the whole game. Like he didn't, you know, there was nothing about like benefiting the consumer or anything about the non yeah, point of the law. It was just, I am a regulator. As a regulator, I can block deals. Big companies emerging, I want to block deal. And it's like, no, that, that's not, at no point is that, it just reminds me, you know, all the stereotypes of bad policemen or something mm -hmm. who they've got it. They've got a badge in the gun. They're going to let everyone know it. The regulators in this case have a badge and a gun over big companies and they're going to let everyone know it, whether what the big companies are doing are good, bad, whatever. I, I love the interaction between the uh, competition commission lawyer and the appellate judges. The appellate judges, I thought, were handled the whole thing very well. But he had this point that he thought was incredibly fascinating that they just could not fathom what he cared about, which was um, he got 
that the authorities approved the deal. And he got that they approved the deal that would happen and the only deal that would happen and the fix that would happen and the buyer of the fix and the price. They approved the thing that would happen, but he just thought it was just of utmost urgency that they go back and opine specifically on the deal that's not going to happen, that nobody's trying to do the unfixed deal. And this was, I mean, it seemed to him to be like the most awful imaginable thing that this hypothetical thing that would not happen did not have a formal part of the process. And these judges were just trying to understand what his point was. Um, and uh, uh, a, a good friend of mine who never agrees with me on public policy arguments, whenever I get shrill on a procedural point, he said, just to save us time, why don't we only discuss procedural points when they're against substantive interests? Because he points out like, we almost never have something where I'm railing about some procedural point that wouldn't serve some end that I also substantively believed in. Like, it's like, never. And he's like, if we have anything really good to say about how we need to improve procedure, let's just mention it when it would hurt our substantive point we're trying to make. And that would like remove pretty much 100%. Like it, it, he just hated the deal. He hated the companies. He wanted to hurt them. And so he had this thing, but the judges who didn't care and who never heard about this stuff before, they're like, why, why are we even talking about this? We're yeah. talking about it. And just to, just to sum up, in sure. case listeners haven't been following this Canadian court case, what what he's doing is he's, going, that? if I remember correctly, Shaw and Rogers had an original divestiture plan that did not pass muster. Uh, it was going to get rejected. So they went and found a divestiture plan that did pass muster. And basically the regulator here was saying, hey, judge, I still need you to go back. You know, it's like if if I turned in a final paper and the professor came back and failed me because she went and found my my first draft and said, oh, Andrew, this first draft wrong, wrong on every single point. I was like, yeah, but my final draft right. was right. Why am I getting dragged in on this first draft, which, you know, shouldn't really see the light of day. Nobody should have cared about any of that type of stuff. Yeah. Or you're just kind of annoyed. You can imagine a parent uh, who, you know, they're, you know, you, you have a whole lecture prepared for them about missing curfew and they make it at the last minute. It's like, yeah. well, like in theory, you're trying to substantively help something for the greater good. And that thing was done you should be happy but you're kind of like you had this you had your speech already um and so i think spectrum is actually it seems so far to be in the same category where they enunciated a problem the companies offered to a hundred percent solve it and the government at least so far does not appear to even want to have a conversation about uh the entirety of the fix so uh, again it seems like a point that they're trying to make but in terms of thinking about arbitrage and deal risk, I still am close to 10 out of 10 at the moment of my concerns on both the regulatory side and the credit side. So I'm being a fairly cowardly uh, or just want to really get paid well for either of those risks, which means... Uh, you know I like widespreads. And one reason why I like widespreads just analytically is it's a big target where you have lots of ways to win. You know, you get Rika and you win and you get a big delay and you win. And if it's supposed to be, you know, the upside is an IRR that's 100% or 80% and it takes twice as long as you think it's gonna, you win. Tight spreads are small targets and you kind of have to be right about everything or it's a stupid investment. And so really wide spreads that already price in kind of deal break probability on something where you won't mind owning it anyways, where you think it's an analytical downside and where it's already priced for regulatory aggression. So, you know, we're getting there on Activision, you know, we already have a complaint filed. And I think things get more, uh, more objective when you get in front of a judge. I mean, it's not exactly the same, but I think that uh, if you uh, if you use uh, the value investing analogy of Buffett's uh, kind of uh, short term voting machine, long term weighing machine, the regulators or these regulators at least are a voting machine, and the judges for the most part are weighing machines. Yep. No, I, look, I, I completely agree with you. you. Know, just on Activision, I, I, we've we've discussed it ad nauseum on this podcast, but yeah. you know, 
<laughs> it's funny. We've probably been discussing it for, I don't know, six months at this point. Mm-hmm. And when we started discussing it, the price was probably $75 per share. And now we're still discussing the price $75 per share. And, you know, I think, look, I, I will say like, the thing that vexes me, I think the thing I email you once a week on, the thing that you're smarter on me, but I think we're both so unclear on is Activision needs to get approved by three people at this point. They need U.S. regulators to approve it, and that's mainly the FTC. They need the EU regulators to approve it, and they need the UK CMA to approve it. And, like, I feel good. They can beat the FTC in court, even if the FTC is trying to tortiously interfere with other jurisdictions. I think they can come to a settlement with the EU. I The UK CMA, like, I think they can, but I just don't – I don't know, like – as you said, voting machine versus uh, weighing machine, if the voting machine of UK regulators doesn't approve this, I don't know how you get to the weighing machine step. So yeah. that's one. And then I'll let you say anything you want there. And then I'll we can talk about like kind of the fundamental value as well. Sure. Um, I think were I working on this for Microsoft, first of all, I'd decide if I really wanted to do the deal at this point and see how much you really wanted to try. I think they are trying. I think there'd be good precedent for getting this deal done. I think they want to buy the company. Um, I would, I sometimes think of my strategy in certain things as a, my stupid phrase for it is reverse triage where you basically have all this complexity interaction. Like, can you just get the easy stuff done first? Uh, which not out of intellectual laziness, but out of, by the time you get to the really hard stuff, then you have fewer things to worry about. I would focus on the EU first and settle with the EU and settle with the EU on terms that show how you interact with them, how you are, uh, how you are um, fixed with luck. And of course, settling with the EU is really settling with large complaining competitors, Uh, get them on board with an EU settlement uh, and then market that to the CMA and then market that in the U.S. to the ALJ uh, and uh, settle in the U.S. last. And ideal, and so, so that would be my order of operations. And I also would be looking for sneaking in as much as possible because this is going to be a big, expensive, complex process and a big settlement. Uh, I would work on sneaking in as much uh, malice for my competitors as possible. If there's gonna be this big settlement that restructures the industry. Uh, uh, the best thing that's been written about this recently was this wonderful piece that basically went through all of the iterations this industry's had going back over the last few decades and any big antitrust settlement would have frozen that permutation of the industry that's just in constant tumult. Who's on top, who's on bottom, how these companies are structured. They've put these together and ripped them apart a dozen times as the market has evolved. It's it's an incredibly competitive dynamic market. And uh, the government would just freeze it at one moment arbitrarily. uh, And then that's how it would be a hundred years from now uh, for something that has nothing to do with technology, nothing to do with helping customers, just has to do with the government wanting to make sure it looks like it's in charge. Uh, But in this case, it could really use that against um, uh, some of the complainers and some of the competitors and really put Microsoft in terms of how things are done in the relationship between consoles, games, content, and platforms, they could make sure that if we're going to freeze everything, uh, I think that Microsoft lawyers could do an incredibly good job freezing themselves on top. Um, yeah. So they could actually win on this deal in a number of ways. It makes it. I mean, I would be pretty surprised if you could do a legal settlement now that froze the video game industry for, in its current structure for a hundred years, but I, I do hear what you're saying. Uh, but no, and then just the other thing on Activision, you know, I, I have so many people and it's generally journalists who reach out to me on this versus mm-hmm. kind of experts, but they'll reach out and they'll be like, hey, Activision Blizzard, you know, I, I think it's a heads I win, tails I win more situation where, you know, the deal goes through, I'm buying it 75 and I think uh, it's, you know, you get over 90 from the Microsoft payment. And then they'll say, well, if the deal doesn't go through, like the simple math is Activision will get two and a half or three billion dollars from microsoft they'll have a ton of cash on their balance sheet i think they can earn four dollars per share this year four times 20 gets me to an 80 dollars stock price plus the cash on their balance sheet and they're like fundamental value i win uh, deal goes through i win like what's the risk here and i kind of just look at them like 
event investors will remember NXPI and NXPI Mm -hmm. had the exact same thing when they were getting bought and uh, the Chinese authorities blocked that deal from Qualcomm. And, you know, the stock was 130 and everybody said, oh, if this doesn't go through, it's going to 150. If it does go through, it's 135. We're getting it. And guess what? The deal broke and NXPI three months later was trading like 70 or 80 per Mm -hmm. share. And it didn't touch, it's higher now, but this was 2018 or so. It didn't touch a hundred per share again till, you know, like mid 2020, late 2020 or something. I look at Activision, I'm like, hey, you know, companies under M&A, they tend to kind of freeze. Yes, it seems to be performing well now, but it's a video game company. Like go look at Take-Two, go look at Ubisoft, go look at these guys. Like video game earnings can disappear in a hurry. And yeah, I'm just, I'm a little scared everywhere just because, it's such a po- it's such a popular deal. It's the biggest merger arbitrage out there. Like everyone's looking at it. I'm I'm just a little hesitant on it. Yeah, I mean the the market generally has been strong this year, but just looking back over the last year, I think there's been an almost perfect record of it's already priced in not being correct in bear markets. And all maybe it's just defining terms. Maybe it's just tautology, but that in weak markets something bad happens, the deal gets blocked, they want to get done, it trades down. Uh, So I think that to the extent that at least at our scale, I mean, I think it would be different if you wanted to buy, you know, a huge, you know, 58, it's a pretty big liquid stock. It might be less the case if you wanted a $5 billion position. If you want $100 million or $200 million, or for your PA, want $100,000, I think you can buy it after a break at a better price. Like even if you, this is what you want to own, I don't think there's a need to own it. I, I doubt this is a real true actual arbitrage where you're going to win either way. You can say that, but I don't think it's probably literally correct. Um, it's probably not in terms of sizing it. It's probably doesn't take you out on the downside, right? Like a huge position. Yeah. Uh, it, it's in, in, in Huge position in Twitter could have taken you out on a break. Um, uh, I don't think a huge position in Activision takes you out. That's a good point. And like, we're, again, we've been talking about this since probably last summer. And last summer, it was a little bit different where, you know, I, I believe the the stock market was down a little bit more. Like the stock market's had a big rally recently. So mm-hmm. stock market down a little bit more. So you're probably looking at Activision's fundamental value being lower. Mm-hmm. And um, and Activision was not performing as well, right? Like the the new Call of Duty, which I believe has been a huge hit, hadn't come out. There were lots of questions around Blizzard. They were having all these issues. So like probably the fundamental performance and the multiple has gotten better since then. So it's mm-hmm. a good point. Like you can run it to much let much better downside today than you could uh, a couple of years ago. Anyway, I, I guess that's it on Activision. What else has been on your mind? Yeah. Oh, last, last little Activision thought is over the holidays I had... Uh, family staying with me. And every time I kind of groused at people that I need to go back to work and my uh, mom or dad would be in the house, it was always like looking at Activision and, and like checking on their new games, which I had to tell them like, no, this literally is the work I, I need to understand this video game company and these new games they're putting out. But it, it looked so unserious that I was like, geez, now I need to come up with like a project that looks more like work to other people than looking at this video game company. Uh, it sounded exactly, you know, 40 years ago, like I would have sounded making an excuse on, no, this really is my homework. Um, but uh, anyways, yeah. It's that's- like when uh, when we were looking at Bob Evans and we were just shoveling yeah. uh, mashed potatoes into our mouth, like, look, this isn't because we're gluttonous. This, yeah, is, no. this is serious due diligence here. And if I remember correctly, my, my wife and I went and we had their, uh, we went and tried a lot of their menu, and one of them was their their candied bacon. I was yeah. like, Alicia, we need two orders of the candied bacon, not because candied bacon is the most delicious thing in the world, because this is serious due diligence. We need to get this one right. Um, so let's see. So um, I think litigation is very interesting this year. I think kind of waiting until we're in front of the judge. I think that there's interesting um, thinking about January, since we're kind of coming to the end of the month that we're talking about here. Uh, Interesting that some of the kind of zany, uh, faddish retail uh, uh, meme stocks are kind of back in action this month, Uh, even with what I generally would think of as a more serious environment. You know, my, my gripe the entire 
bull market is can't we just raise interest rates to 5% for one quarter just to wipe out everybody who shouldn't be in business? Um, we in this kind of weird environment where you don't have a cost of capital now, you do. I would have thought to some extent things would just get kind of monotonically more serious, but some of the zany stuff's kind of coming back um, uh, between you know, AMC and, and uh, uh, Bed Bath and & Beyond and, and uh, some of the names that were kind of super hot, you know, uh, over the last few years, kind of having, having kind of kicking around a little bit this month. Uh, Tesla's doing very well. Yeah, it's been, so A, my favorite meme for the past nine months has been every time another meme stock does some type of squeeze, uh, it, you, somebody will post the the meme of Jerome Powell being like, oh, I've got, if you guys keep doing this, I'm going to raise interest rates yeah. by another 50 basis points or something. That's That's been my favorite meme. But yeah, it's been really weird this week. You know, you've you've seen the return of, not this re, this this month, you've seen the return of meme stocks. Uh, oh, here we go. A, as you and I are talking, uh, Bed Bath & Beyond, which is one that you and I were talking about, like literally as we're recording this podcast, they got a default notice from JP Morgan and the stock's going crazy. But, you know, Bed Bath & Beyond is the perfect one. Before we started recording this podcast, Bed Bath & Beyond had a stock price of, 350 per share, let's call it, right? And that gave it a market cap of 400 million, which is not huge, but you could go look at the debt. The debt was trading for literally pennies on the dollar. You know, like it was not trading 80% of par where maybe there's some ups, it was trading 6% of par, right? When debt trades that low, there is no equity recovery for a bankruptcy. They mm -hmm. were There were all these reports about uh, they're getting ready to file for bankruptcy and nobody would give them a debtor in possession loan, right? If you can't get a debtor in possession loan in bankruptcy, like forget unsecured bonds, forget equity. Like people are questioning if your business can, like every dollar that goes in, they think it's going to get lit on fire because debtor in possession loans are some of the best loans generally yeah. you can make. Like, and this stock, again, I understand it's only a couple hundred million market cap. It's getting squeezed around like crazy, but it's just really weird. And the so that anyway, that one was weird, but I understand like there's no borrow, all this type of stuff. The the one that really jumps out to me is AMC8, which I know you and I have talked about. You've written up a little bit like, mm -hmm. look, AMC8 are, and anyone who wants to talk about this, like I've read the contract. I'd love to hear anybody who's got, actual other thoughts if you've read the contract and stuff i don't want to hear amc to the moon but like amc stock is trading for 550 per share ape is trading for a dollar 70 per share they're under contract to collapse those two securities and i think it's going to happen in the next 60 days maybe it's the next 100 days but those two securities are going to collapse and you know you rarely you can buy two apes for less than one for one amc right now and those two securities are going to collapse, I think. So uh, they're under contract. They have every incentive in the world to do it. I keep looking at this. Again, I understand like there are borrow issues there. People are worried AMC is going to squeeze. But when you've got that big a spread, like I, I did a post late last month, you can use options to cover the difference and still make a really attractive return. I just keep looking at this and being like, what am I missing here? The prices can't all be right. I mean, we know there's a parent. We know there's a paradox. Um, and we know the less expensive side of it. And what we don't know is how the more expensive side of it behaves. And it's hard to do just stock for stock ratio in a way that, that uh, is, is particularly attractive. So you have to use options or just do it unhedged or just say, look, I am going to stipulate part of my trade. I'm not going to justify part of my trade. Uh, I'm going to stipulate it. I'm going to say, there are people out there who think this is worth a certain amount, demonstrably today think it's worth a certain amount. I am not one of those people, uh, but I'm going to just defer to them in the coming months that they are going to hold their view or within 50% of their view with 60, 70% of their view. I mean, it's a, it's a big fat, tar big spreads are big targets. Lots of crazy things can happen uh, and you can still make money um, just owning the cheap side of it. Uh, yeah. No, um, look, it's a good point. Cause what you're saying is you can just, because AMC is so difficult to borrow, if you want, you could just go buy Ape and say, look, AMC and Ape are going to collapse. I'm just going to bet that the collapse is somewhere between where AMC and Ape trade right now. 
Hopefully the collapse is not like well below. And, you know, if you do that with smart sizing, I, I think it can work well. But my the, the thing I struggle with there, and I do think it, it's fine because like AMC is so clearly propped up by these meme traders and, mm-hmm. it, you know, like the bonds there, they're not bed, bath and beyond. They're not trading at six cents on the dollar, but they're close. You know, their bonds trade about 50 cents on the dollar. And I think the equity is fundamentally quite impaired. So like you're buying a security that looks worthless. But as you said, like, who are we to question the market? If the market says one's a dollar ninety, one's five, like why should the why should we say oh the value zero just because we think I, it's just tough? They're not doing what you do badly. They're doing something else. If I was going to own a share of MGM and said, oh my gosh, what if everybody approached the slots with my view of what their rational behavior would be tomorrow? Then it would say, okay, then it's going to go to zero tomorrow. Um, but I don't think it's they're, everybody's going to do what I think is rational for them tomorrow. I think they're going to keep kind of doing the same thing they're doing today. My and mom and grandma go. certainly aren't coming with that rational view. That's their favorite thing in the world. And so they're going to kind of, so I'm going to simply stipulate what slot lovers are going to do with slots next month. I'm not going to demand that they instantly start agreeing with me on what's optimally rational. And that's my view of AMC stockholders. I don't think they're trying to do what I try to do. They're doing something else. And I don't have a reason to think that's going to change immediately. Um, At least, you know, it's harder if you give me a year or two. I just think it's going to be for a month or two, more or less the same. And with some shot if you said something crazy happens with amc in the next month or two i don't know it could also go up 10 times or something like you have all sorts of crazy things i just don't see it being less risky or less volatile with a big hedge and the world of kind of hedge fund guys wanting to do a arithmetically correct hedge you know i'm always worried about the um you know, the Volkswagen type scenario of just like something where like just own the cheap part of it and it might be less dangerous than what is mathematically more precise, but in a world where something crazy can happen, it might hurt you. And look, like AMC 8, right? I remember when, so AMC had one share of stock, just AMC. They could not, they hit their statutory limit. They're they're literally, uh, their certificate of incorporation, they hit the limit on that and their shareholders wouldn't approve more. So they issued Ape as like a workaround. And I remember when Ape came out, you know, Ape and AMC economically are equivalent things. They only trade different because of this, that one loophole. When it came out, I remember AMC was at like eight and Ape was at five. And I got so many emails that were like, short AMC, long Ape, go to the beach. And before mm-hmm. this collapse happened, AMC was seven and Ape was about 60 cents. So if you had short an AMC and gone to the beach, you were getting margin calls at the beach left and yeah. right because the AMC bar was crazy. But what I love about this is like, you know, A, you've got a, the company's under contract to collapse these things. They've got all the economic incentives in the world to collapse these things. It's a massive spread. And, you know, if you, you know, nothing on here is financial advice, but if you're trying to play this by either just buying eight or using options cover, like you're also, I think the fundamental value is worthless, but if you got a meme squeeze and this collapse, like, Ape could go from two to 20, you know, you know, you never know. So you're giving yourself the upside exposure of something wildly different than what you and I think is going to happen happening there, but and, it's just and, wild. And again, I know these are meme stocks and everybody says, oh, it's a joke. They're weird, but it, there's also securities. Like we can look at them and, you know, weird things should have mispricing. I remember when GameStop went from 200 to 600, there was somebody who had bought $150 put the next day, GameStop has gone from 200 to 600. The put had gone up in value because the volatility had gone so high. Or, you know, GameStop, like, puts 99% out of the money. We're trading with such implied vol, you could, like, make really good money. Like, you can make money on meme stocks. You, you don't have to just, like, completely ignore them just because they're crazy. Uh, I because I like to write about these things after we set ourselves up, however we set up, I'm kind of more familiar with some of these reactions than I would be otherwise. And the two that really stand out for me are early on writing about the AMC uh, APE divergence and realizing there's some people who just like the AMC stock and they don't want to talk about anything else. And these are not people who are ever going to do 
a dip, dip loan or something like I'm always like saying like, okay, posit a view on a company, optimize where in the capital structure, you have the best upside downside probability, but they're not thinking about upside or downside or probability. They're thinking about they like the stock. The same thing earlier on with, I remember getting the reactions to, um, I think it was Nikola and the stock being super expensive relative to warrants or anything like it'd be, they, it was, it was incoherently expensive. And I just got these reactions. I was like speculation, just like any other equity, bro. Trust me. I understand the logic, but I made a ton with this stock already. And if it goes up or down, I'm okay with that. And that was like, one of the, and you get like hundreds of reactions like that. And so you think, okay, they're not trying to do the same thing, but they exist. They, they can move markets. They're in some of these things and they've all crowded into, I mean, I don't think it's a huge part of the market overall, but they've crowded into these very few equities, um, largely on, uh, you know, free trade mobile apps. And, uh, and so I, I don't think they go away all at once. I mean, I think they kind of get squished with rising rates, but that at least in January, you wouldn't want to take massively outsized bets the things that they love are going to go away right away. So it, just the retail focused nature reminds me, I, I saw this earlier and I thought you would love it. So a, what made this connection was AMC. I believe if you own AMC stock, they give you like discounts on popcorn and they, they're, they'll like have AMC will have a AMC shareholder day where they'll try to bring P, AMC shareholders into the mood. So like really playing up to a retail base. I, I know in the past you've, talked about you know there are wine companies where if you're a shareholder they'll give you a discount on wine or ski companies yeah. it's like a big deal in japan it's in japan japanese kind of middle class japanese investors can sometimes have like their house just full of free stuff not as common in the u.s but anyways. it's nice and it, look i i can understand like buffett berkshire if you own a berkshire share geico will give you like eight percent off your insurance and i, I can and encourage shareholder mindset I, I get it but my current favorite is my friend just sent me this this morning if you own, it is, I'm looking at my phone to see, I believe it's 20. If you own 20 shares of WeWork, uh, they will give you 50% off a WeWork All Access Plus membership for three months. WeWork stock trades at $1.50 right now. So for $30 worth of WeWork stock, you can get 50% off a WeWork All Access Pass, which if I remember correctly, it's either hundred $100 per month or like $200 per month, depending on which one you get. But obviously, you know, Three months, it's just crazy. You get, you basically get uh, free ownership in WeWork, plus you get a hugely discounted rent. So I, I love stuff like that. I, emotionally, I'm very scale agnostic to free stuff or bargains. You know, it's funny. It's like we all have some big position and it'll be like a significant upside and, you know, like free little things. Like I'll maybe be less happy, but I'll be like half as happy about it, even if it's like a millionth as big a deal. Um, well, yeah, you do have like, to get the the WeWork membership, which obviously you're eventually you'll be up. But if if you want a WeWork membership, anyone who's listening, that's the uh, that's the trade for you. Go, it, it's not it's not a bad one. I, I just randomly waved. My daughter walked by the window, and I've never had somebody walk by while we were recording before. So that was why I just like looked looked up surprised. Um, there's actually I'm not going to mention it until I double check that it's legit. But there's a um, there's a new site that can link into a brokerage account and based on your investments, gives out freebies based on what you own. And some of them are real arbitrages. You know, you own $50 of the stock, you get $50 freebie, this or that. So I'll, I'll, I'll write it up if it's legit, but I'm going to play with it a little bit first just to make sure there's not some catch. I'm just imagining like, hey, you own one share of Ferrari for what is it? It's like $200 per share. We're going to give you a free Ferrari, yeah. $200,000 car. Uh, anything else you wanted to talk about? Ferrari actually does have freebies. And by which I mean, well, we can, you know, they, they do give uh, uh, cars to their best clients that are big discounts to the market price. So that's that's an interesting one, but that's an expensive game to get, to get into. Um, I, uh, the, my one bedroom New York apartment with, uh, I, I don't think we're getting into the Ferrari game anytime soon. No, no, uh, but uh Anyways, what other things? I just want to check, uh, see if anybody asked yeah, questions thing, that we can peel, peel off. I'll just say while, while you're looking through questions, the one thing that's kind of struck me as interesting is when we started doing these over the summer, you know, Nat Gas was nine, 
Mm -hmm. oil was 120. Those are spot prices, not futures prices. I fully acknowledge that. But you and I are doing this in January. Nat gas is 280. Mm -hmm. Oil is 80, right? Mm -hmm. So there's been big drawdowns. And like, one thing that jumps out to me, and I've more, I've more written about it than talked on the podcast. But look, I was saying it all summer, I was like, the curves, the curves for energy and energy company prices are completely diverged. Energy mm -hmm. energy companies are pricing in sixty dollar oil and three dollar nat gas, and oil is a hundred and nat gas is ten. It makes no sense. Every day that this exists, cash is gushing into these companies, and we've kind of seen it play out, right? Like Amplify is one of our favorites that we we talked about, written about ad nauseum, and the stock has done well while oil and net gas have come in a lot. And that's because it was so discounted. And I think you and I, I know you and I both believe the stock's going to do really well once beta comes online. It's got all these other catalysts, probably not, not the time to fully discuss every single catalyst with this position we've written and talked about. But, you know, like it, it just strikes me as over the summer, we were saying oil and energy prices are going to come down. Like, and then what's going to happen to your energy stocks? Like, fine, L look at the prices. And I, I think there's a lot of places where there's, something's kind of similar in the market right now underpaying solves everything like i didn't know it was gonna be a really warm winter i didn't know that now if i didn't have a great way to do this and i wouldn't have done this speculatively because one of the problems with like hedging your book with the commodities outside of the equities is if they're monkeying with it at the same time you could easily be massively over hedged and screw it up and Burn a good idea into a terrible one. But like, boy, if we had hedged out natural gas versus our natural gas equity exposure, that would have been a bonanza. But um, it's really, it's really, I mean, I know there are people who do it. I, I think it takes a lot of money and a dedicated trader to, to hedge commodities is really hard because the commodities well, yeah. are always rolling. Like, you know, a nat gas in the winter when nat gas is really in demand is generally more expensive than nat gas in the fall. So which are you hedging? But it's just, it's really tough. And, you know, you expose yourself to, yeah, as you said, what happens if nat gas is short for one delivery cycle and nat gas goes from two to 20 on the delivery yeah. or, you know, oil is the most famous. You could have been long oil short an energy company in 2020 saying these energy companies are pricing in the energy curve. And then oil goes from 30 to negative 30 in a day. And all of a sudden you're like, oh, okay. Yeah. I just, it's just really hard to hard hedge equities with commodities. Yeah, it, it probably would have made our risk and volatility worse, but it's just, you look at this, I, I think, boy, across energy and commodities right now, it, it's just amazing how much the, equities still i mean just have survived this move so far and still just look disconnected um and i think um uh jeremy raper's done incredibly good work on the on the coal side but a lot of these you just net of what you could get back in cash in a very short period of time you own all these things free and clear like hold your breath and you know like in a few years from now like just if you just think about it like the easiest way for me to think about this is always one times leverage my own money, forget about the audience, forget about the volatility, forget about the explaining day to day or week to week. Uh, and that's not our whole job. I mean, you know, if you have all the kind of short term issues you have to deal with in terms of pressure. But if nobody was looking right now, if we had no audience, it was just your money and my money one times leverage plus nobody else. I think the most interesting thing right there is just like what you can own free and clear that you've paid nothing for and out of what you get back in cash in things that I think are incredibly unpopular to own. Well, I think largely because of the uh, ESG stuff uh, and cyclical and volatile and uh, exposed, I think very exposed, and it's very, very hard to have precise, correct views on the demand side, or you have to know about macro and this or that. But on the supply side, it's quite it, analyzable. It, and it feels to me it, like across all commodities, not all commodities, but most commodities, it just feels to me, and I feel like a crazy, like doom prepper, but it feels like the war, the world is short, like structurally short every type of commodity you know and or if it's not structurally short the balance is hanging on a knife's edge and if like you know if freeport in in texas blows up actually that's not a great but you know it, it just feels like if one little kink gets thrown into the wrench and all these things go parabolic because the demand is so tight for them and 
you, you know, like uh, the, the supply is just so limited because these things, they're infrastructure, basically. It takes years and years to build them up. And it just feels like we've underinvested so much. And I, I feel like a doom prepper looking at all this stuff, but I'm just like, I feel like it, from a value investor piece, I'm like, hey, I'm paying 20% below the curve, even after the curves come down a lot. And by the way, it seems like we're structured short these things. So it seems like the curve has, it's more pressure to the upside and downside. Like it's almost the best of both worlds. I, I think I have less and less to say because I just don't think I'm that persuasive on it. And I'm not sure that I'm right on kind of philosophical trade-offs that are on the efficiency curve between economic growth and environmental protectionism say, but I'm incredibly interested in and feel sort of bold about not philosophical differences, but about incoherence. So if the world says we want an energy transition, we want green new energy, we want intermittent fuel, and we're going to not just rhetorically commit, but we're going to actually commit with our capital to something that may or may not be a good idea. I'll set aside whether it's a good or bad idea for 2050, but it is not available for 2024, but we're acting as if we just kind of are, uh, uh, are, are, are blocking our ears for what we're going to do with a multi-decade difference between our philosophical preferences and our day-to-day needs or year-to-year needs. And we're just going to run into this in a few years. And in some cases, we're actually going to trade down on the environmental uh, 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 benefits uh, just because of the practical needs. And we've kind of had a little bit of a waiver because of this warm winter. But if this winter was as surprisingly cold as it was surprisingly warm, we would have been hit with it immediately. And we, it could be next year. The one that jumps out to me, so like, look, everybody loves nuclear now. I, I get it. I, I'm I'm all on board. Nuclear is clean. It's really efficient. Like all oh, this, great. The one that really jumps out to me, in Europe, you know, geopolitically should you have seen getting all your gas from the russians might have like put you in a weird spot probably but i I can understand like not being prepared for this major gas supplier to basically go offline because they decide to launch a war into another country right but the one that always jumps out to me and everybody points to it but it is so crazy to me new england over the winter is burning oil Mm -hmm. because they don't have enough natural gas and there's it's cold and the shirt it's like the U.S. has more natural gas than they freaking than we freaking know what to do with. All we have to do is build pipelines. And natural gas, obviously, it's not the greenest thing in the history of the world, but natural gas is really clean. Mm-hmm. And as a transition source, yeah, I'd rather be on nuclear for base litter. But natural, like you're burning oil and wood instead of natural gas because you won't build a freaking pipeline from wherever you want to call them the the Middle East or in the midwest or texas you won't build a pipeline like it's absolutely crazy to me and you look at this stuff like it, these decisions have ramifications and you know if i i wrote in the oil thing like the reason we stopped having peak oil fill fears in the late the late 2000s early 2000s is because we found the permian basin and we found the shale revolution and everything in the u.s like if that happened today would politicians even allow for the infrastructure to exploit all of that to be built? Like, I, I don't know. Anyway, I feel like a crazy person because I'm generally on board with like transitioning to cleaner stuff. I think electric yeah, cars sure. are awesome, but it, why can't we have both like clean that gas, nuclear and start a transition? Wherever we want to ultimately end up, I think it's almost definitional of being an adult and being rational to say, let's do what makes the most sense now, now. And we can talk about later, later. And I think that in some of these environmental conversations, it feels more like having a conversation with somebody else about their religion, where they're not trying to meet you with logic on a kind of secular footing of just upside downside probability. It's really, uh, I think it started with a philosophically a driven group that was very effective at um, convincing people in the government. And then they subsequently have gotten very good at convincing people in the investing community that it would be good for them as a business. And if you look at places like BlackRock, some of the most strident environmentalists now are massive capital allocators. Um, They're a lot less strident about it when they're investing in China 
uh, where they don't have the same uh, influence, even where there's a lot that's dirtier. I mean, they're trying to solve these problems globally, you just walk into this buzzsaw of if you can't control China, it's almost, it's very fraught at getting it better just in the developed Western world. Um, but the ESG stuff has been really good bits. I mean, you look at even just the marketing it has been really effective. And so once you have the capital allocators and the government and the philosophical environmental movement, it's just been incredibly effective. And my concern, I mean, I have a lot of concerns, but the concern that I think is the one that we can express as an investment uh, is that there's just this difference between the practical needs and the kind of hopes and the identity that people want to associate with in terms of where they'd put their money. And so you just have these underinvested needs. And then and then you get these just crazy situations where they're saying, you know, the price is too high, so we need to crush supply. Okay. Right. Um, it's crazy. Yeah, it's been wild. Anyway, I mean, I'm sure I, people wanted to hear us go on a rant about, sorry uh, about energy energy supply. Uh, we, we've been going almost an hour. Anything else you wanted to talk about or should, uh, anything else you want to get out before we talk? No, I think, I, think, I, think uh, I liked our energy rant. Um, I think that that's um, pretty good. Thank you for having me on. I, I've liked our energy rant too because it's, it's also been a profitable one too. But uh, no, it, it's just crazy. Thanks for coming on, Chris. Uh, looking forward to seeing you new Canaan next week. Looking forward to chatting awesome. on the podcast next month. And we will uh, talk then. Talk to you then. A quick disclaimer, nothing on this podcast should be considered investment advice. Guests or the hosts may have positions in any of the stocks mentioned during this podcast. Please do your own work and consult a financial advisor. Thanks.